come here, get off. Today, we're excited to have Leone Ross, the brilliant mind behind drag. Leone is a Jamaican-British fiction writer, editor, and academic who writes literary fiction, magic realism, horror, and erotica. Leone is a two-time novelist whose short stories have been published widely. Leone's novel, Orange Laughter, was named one of the most influential British novels of the last 25 years. Yo, that's crazy. (laughs) 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 And and you're the 2017 short story collection, Come Let Us Sing Anyway, which is where drag appears, has Mm -hmm. been described as remarkable, serially empathetic, outrageously funny, and unforgettable. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> a former journalist, Leone is currently a senior lecturer in creative writing at Roehampton University in London, commissioning editor for Fitcham Press, and senior fellow of the UK Higher Education Academy. Woo, mm-hmm. yes, Leone. That makes me sound like I'm not going to swear, but it's not true. Oh, well, good. We you want to write places. cursing <laughs> ac- academics. So, yes. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> so, first, we just want to ask what are your preferred pronouns? Um, she and her. Great. Okay. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Always want to make sure we get it right. Yep. So we just heard your whole bio. I just read it. It's mm-hmm. fantastic. Um, but can you tell us in one sentence what it is that you do? Wow. Um, I suppose I pay attention to small spaces mm-hmm. and then try to recreate them. That's what comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing that since I was a little girl, paying attention to small space. That's what's up. So where are you from originally? You know, I I said earlier, you're Jamaican British. Um, Okay. Yes. So you're going to hear a lot of weird accent things going on. And then I have this very (laughs) irritating thing that I do that when I'm in the company of people who have a different accent from me, I start creeping into it, which is just really embarrassing. So wait for that. But um, the background is that I was born in England. Um, and when I was six, my mother, who is Jamaican, um, took me back to Jamaica and I stayed there till I was about 21 and I did my first degree there and then I returned to England. So all of my formative years were spent, spent in Jamaica. And if I'm among other Jamaicans, I sound much more Jamaican than I sound now. All Jamaicans tease me that when I lose my temper or have sex, I sound Jamaican. (laughs) And if I'm speaking formally, I sound British. British people tell me I don't sound British at all. And Americans, Jamaicans say I also sound, no, British people say I sound American. And Americans tell me I don't sound American at all. So who, who the fuck? (laughs) But that's, that's my basic background. There's a lot of mix. Uh, I suppose at, at its heart, I feel Jamaican mm-hmm. um, more than anything else. But I think that's a formative year thing, you know, wherever you were, you know, wherever you, were, you grew up, wherever you went to high school, I think mm-hmm. as well makes a difference. So, yeah, so that's kind of a positive issue. So, Leonie, where right are there. you based now? I now live in London where I have lived for 20 <coughs> many years. Um, <laughs> and... Um, which is presently imploding and totally screwing up and Brexit is driving us all crazy and the Conservative government is driving us possibly just as crazy as Trump is. I was about to say, uh, we might know a little something about that. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, I don't want to assume, but I assume. I assume that considering you guys like sex, that you don't like sex. Not at all. Yes, not at all. It's the best (laughs) assumption anybody's made all day. Spot on. (laughs) So basically that man has never, never given a woman an orgasm and that's his problem. Well, I mean, he's probably had them, but he's never oh my given God, one. No. Oh, no, 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 definitely. I mean, it takes two minutes to have an orgasm, especially if you're a man, but yeah. especially if you're giving it to yourself, but to give a woman an orgasm, huh. good. that would uh, require, verb, but you know what I mean? To share in a woman's orgasm requires. Yeah. A level of consciousness. Like none of yeah. Yeah. Not yes, no. exactly. No. Yeah. Yeah. I don't believe I'm spending the first five minutes cursing the president of the United States. I mean, I feel like it's how we should probably open all spaces. So it's fine. Mm-hmm. It's like an invocation um. of fuck this shit. <laughs> <laughs> the best invocation of all. So, Leonie, did you always know that you wanted to be a writer? What did you want to be when you grow up? 
Yeah, always, always. I mean, there was a period in which I wanted to be a vet, a veterinary surgeon, because wow. I really love animals. But that wasn't, that was to accompany the writing. I think I always knew and I was, you know, one of those children who you'd take me to the beach and I'd sit down and be reading a book and people would be like, look at the waves. I'd be like, but there are waves in the book. So I don't know why you're bugging me about the waves right. in reality. And I can picture so, how they look however I want, right? Like, yeah, exactly. Right. I can make them green or blue or purple or orange. So, you know, leave me alone. Um, having said that, I really like the water and I like the beach. But yeah, it, you know, I was that kind of kid. So I always, I think I always knew that one of the best ways to spend time was to read a book hmm. and then when I began to start writing I I always think I had an impulse to I wanted to make people feel I think that was my initial impulse and when I began to work out that I could write things down on a piece of paper and make people laugh or or get upset or be delighted or move them or that other people did that because obviously when I was a little kid I just had ambitions to do that I still thought that was a kind of magic hmm. I still do like, you know, when you write, you must know this, when you write something on page 49 on, you know, section three, paragraph two, that's intended to make your audience laugh, and then you read it out loud, and wherever you go, in wherever you are in the world, they laugh at that moment. Uh-huh. I love that shit. <laughs> like, yes, yeah. that's what I want you to do. <laughs> laugh at that moment, get aroused at this moment, you know, cry at this moment. Yeah. Maybe I was just a control freak when I was a kid, but that's what I wanted. I mean, who isn't? I oh. feel like, Leone, <laughs> yes. I feel like you are describing my best friend right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tell me, tell me, was it like that, like that for you as well? Uh, yeah. Um, yep. <laughs> I have, I have <laughs> control <laughs> issues. But I think more than that, I mean, this sounds sad, but books have always like been just a really great friend. I mean, obviously not as great. I'm gonna say I'm a bad bitch, Aww. but okay. <laughs> yes, you are a bad bitch, and the books can never compare. But books have been my constant companion. I mean, I yes. you know I started reading really young, and I was never without one. And now that we have tech, where it's just in my phone. I mean, it's everything. I spend so much time writing books and reading books, and they're mm-hmm. just a comfort to me. So yes, yeah, there, are, there. There's no question, and you know, all of the research shows us that actually. Nothing does things to the brain like mm-hmm. reading does. Nothing still. No kind of art form. That's right. Uh, no kind of orgasmic experience even does exactly what what is done to the brain when we read. Mm. So, yes. I mean, obviously, we're all fans. That's what's up. So, as we, you know, were saying up in your bio, you write a lot more than erotica. And, in fact, Come Let Us Sing Anyway has stories in lots of different genres. I'm wondering mm. what pushes you to dip into so many different areas with your writing? Probably because I read so many different areas. I'm not and have never been uh, the kind of novelist or reader that dismissed any particular genre as long as it was well written within its own context I was fine so and I've always wanted to be an accessible human being not to mention a writer I I never I think it would it wouldn't trouble me if someone read my work and thought this is this is challenging this is you know um, this makes me think I'm not quite sure what this means I need to go check again that's all fine but if I can't access your basic emotions quite swiftly I think that I personally haven't succeeded so and and genre some genre writing is some of the best writing there is so um I remember once um I think making some weird reference this is years ago to an editor that I had I mentioned something about the word obsidian and he said um he said some highfalutin academic thing in response to the words. I said, no, I meant the Obsidian Order on Star Trek. And he's like, what? <laughs> he's like, but you're such an intelligent woman. I thought, what does that even mean, that you can't be an intelligent woman and read Shakespeare and right. pay attention to Star Trek? I mean, popular and high culture, whatever that means. So I suppose that's all a way of saying that I'm interested in all ways of moving people. Complex literary fiction, I make an attempt at, and I hope that I can make a metaphor like the next person. Um, and I'm interested in complex ideas and beautiful language. In fact, I love that. But I also want to be able to chill your bones. I want to be able to turn you on. I want to be able to surprise you. I want to make you laugh. So if I manage to do all of those things, great. And I wouldn't limit myself to any one genre in order to try to get that kind of emotional response. Hmm. Did you, I'm wondering, I mean, I 
I love that you have never thought to, um, you know, limit yourself in that way. But I'm wondering, I guess as as a writer as well, like I write, you know, I write quote unquote serious nonfiction. Um, mm-hmm. But did you ever struggle with the decision to add erotica to the mix? Like, does it, did it? No. It, well, I mean, the erotic was always there. I mean, the, the irony is that a lot of people in Britain who, the few who know me, um, of, of that subset, associate me of being the sex writer which is really funny because um because it's the smallest amount of of the genre i do mm-hmm. i mean as you can see in come let us sing anywhere there are only like three stories i think that have any kind of uh, you know explicit sexual reference but right. i remember trying to work this out at one point laughing of all people with my grandmother about it who by the way has read it before she, before she passed read everything i ever um, wrote, including the the Aww. you know the explicit okay. sexuality. We stand and, um, a supportive <laughs> granny. I love her so much for that. I, it's so totally wonderful. And um, I remember saying to her, you know, maybe a little sex goes a long way. I've just become this kind of sex writer when that's not the whole story. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't have a problem with it. It just wasn't the whole story. So she just looked at me. She said, the, "The thing with you is that not only do you write explicit sexuality, you've also injected your entire work." with a sense of sexuality or with a sense of the body. And she said, you do that all the time in ways that I don't even think that you recognize. So she said, I think people mistake um, that sense of sensuality and the body. They think sex. So you're not always talking about sex, but you're being sexual a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. This note was my grandmother. And I'm like, yeah, I can go for that. She's like, you have intellectual ideas about sex as well as sensory ideas about sex and language-based ideas about sex and then the sex. So she's like, because you see the world through many lenses, but one of them is human sexuality, I think people then get the impression that you're writing more sex than you are or something like that. That was her view anyway. And I I thought, okay, that'll that'll do as a theory. That's fine. I like it. So let's jump into drag. Um, I loved the story. Absolutely loved it. Um, I mm. am, I'm a reader, but not as much as Kenria. Um, and so this was kind of my first for, foray into erotic fiction. And oh, how wonderful! I was you a, vir- were a virgin. Yeah, yep. I was a virgin. <laughs> so <laughs> at thirty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel yeah, that. So cool. um, and I, I loved the story. So where did mm-hmm. your inspiration from for the story come from? Thank you. I was thinking about this earlier because you also have to remember, I don't know if you've noticed, this is an old story. This is like 18 years old, right? So um, where the hell did it come from? I was trying to work it out earlier. It was something to do with, I do remember the first moment I thought about it. I was walking down the street. And I was, I think, as you Americans say, feeling myself mm-hmm. and um, felt, quite cute, felt quite cute that day. Yes. And felt very, very confident in my stride in that moment and really began to work it and really began to think, I like this. I like my body today. I like the vibes I'm giving out. Mm-hmm. And then I began to think, just wandering down the street, the, the phrase, I feel like a boy came to me. Now, this is not a matter of transsexuality or that complexity and gorgeousness. It was more to do with, I'm taking on a stride that might be associated with masculinity because it is so confident, Mm. because it is so unquestioning, because it takes itself so much for granted. And I remember thinking, uh, let me play around with that idea. A woman who's feeling like a boy today. How might a woman who feels like a boy today want to be approached sexually? How might ideas, whether or not they're stereotypical or not, how might ideas of um, masculinity affect the way a man might approach her sexually? Um, and then I began to think, oh, I could make this into a story. So I thought maybe what we can do is come up with an example of three experiences a woman has with one single man who returns to her three times in her entire life and each one marks a period of development so that was her first period of development she's young she's 18 when she meets him she's walking down the street feeling like a boy and they have an experience that has to do hopefully with ideas of excuse me with ideas of gender and masculinity and femininity 
and she's young, so she's playing and she's really open to playing around with identity and taking chances. When he meets her the second time, it's different. When he meets her the third time, it's different again. Mm -hmm. So that's maybe where the idea came from. That was the genesis. A lot of ideas, a lot of stories come to me both in moments and with wow. sentences. Hmm. So I'm wondering, you know, you the, the genesis really came from you, you know, strutting. Mm -hmm. Are there mm -hmm. any ways um, more specifically that you relate to Josephine? Like, have you found yourself trying on different roles to figure out your place, whether it was sexually or otherwise? I think so. Um, but I think my gift, just to backtrack slightly for context, my gift has been a really good sex education from um, both parents and extended family. Um, it's not that my family doesn't, like any human family, have their own limitations or nervousness about human sexuality, but they certainly nurtured my kind of natural curiosity. It's a kind of family joke that I was so interested in sexuality so young and asked questions so young. And their gift to me was that they answered without any kind of shame, without any kind of guilt. I have to say that again. My computer just did something annoying. Sorry. Yeah, they answered my questions about sexuality when I was a kid without giving me any kind of shame, without giving me any kind of guilt. Um, and so that created a context in which I then, in the process of working out who I was sexually and what I wanted, which I believe, by the way, is a lifetime mm -hmm. job, just like writing, because things change all the time and grow. What I am really grateful for is whatever roles I've played, like the protagonist in this in this. Um, story or not, I haven't felt any shame about it. Pure, straight up curiosity and joy. Which is not to say we don't have issues, we wonder whether we're with the right person, you know, we have certain feelings about our bodies and so on. It's not that it's without pain or complexity. But sex as a pure experience, to me, doesn't actually have anything to do with what the body looks like and it doesn't have anything to do with anything but its own gorgeous sense of, of energy. I mean, do you know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's something unto itself. And an acceptance and love of sexual energy unto itself has allowed me to play with roles or likes or dislikes as they've come up in my life without feeling like I was bad or nasty or wrong, mm. which I love. And I notice a lot of women and men haven't had the same experiences. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes any sense. But yeah. No, it makes total sense. I think it's a gift that they gave you. I mean, they really did. You know, so many of us are walking around out here, you know, broken in that regard, that we yeah. weren't given that space to be able to develop and to find a joy in ourselves and in our bodies and who we love and the ways that we love. And it manifests in so many awful ways in hate. And yeah. And I mean, I've also been blessed because I don't, I, you know, I wouldn't. I mean, one has to be careful when you talk about this to be sensitive and to be compassionate. But I also have been lucky enough not to be the one in three or one in four women who will have some kind of sexual abuse mm. of some type in their lives. And so I'm really grateful for that privilege as well. It's not come to me and it could come to me any minute now. Let's be real about the yeah. way that the world works. And so that also hasn't come to compromise my kind of unfettered Unfettered joy. Jesus, I sound like an academic. It feels good, okay? It feels good and I'm cool with it feeling good and I'm cool with finding it. I'm quite sentimental about sex, actually. And sometimes people don't expect that of me. I remember once having a conversation, my girlfriend's going to kill me, but once having a conversation with a girlfriend of mine, mm. who, you know that numbers question? What's your number? When you're in your 20s, what's your number? Now, I don't give a fuck about anybody's number, right? It doesn't make any difference to me. But she wanted to know my number, so we sat down and we counted up numbers. <laughs> and then she, when we compared numbers, she went, but you can't have such a low number because hmm. she had a higher number than me, right? So I was like, why? She's like, but it's you. <laughs> I was like, what does that even mean? I'm the sex one. <laughs> <laughs> right? She's like, but you're the sex one, exactly. And I was like, but that doesn't mean I'm fucking everybody. Right. Right? It's, it just means I'm working with what works for me. Um, and sh I said, you know, why do you have to bring emotion to this number? Your number is, is just a number. Right. So then she made me recount. She was like, okay, you're bisexual. So now you have to count the women because we were counting men. I was like, okay. So I counted the women and I was still lower than her. And she's like, okay, screw you. Let's count non-penetrative <laughs> sex. 
<laughs> when did you brush past okay. someone in the grocery store? The number went up again with the non-penetrative sex. <laughs> exactly. Shit, I don't even think I can remember all the non-penetrative sex. I know, I know. Truthfully, I couldn't remember. I was like, this is getting ridiculous, right? This is just not necessary. Now, having said that, in her defense, she was also joking. Yeah. It became, of course, a laugh. But just that initial response from her, which was, but I can't have a higher number than you, <laughs> made me also think about the complexities of sexuality and how women are expected to behave when they're cool about sex. Mm -hmm. So therefore you're expected to sleep with lots of people. I mean, do what you want to do. That's my thing. Do what you genuinely want to do and what feels good. That's what's up. So I have a question that, so people ask me this question all the time and it feels like choosing a baby, but you know, you can do it. Do you have Mm -hmm. a favorite line in drag? Oh, my God, you should have warned me of this before. Um, do I have a favorite line? I will start looking for the favorite line while we talk about the things that do up there. Um, I, uh, crap, probably. I'm really tempted to look at page 33 and just say a single crumb sits on his neat mustache, but that's only the Ooh, page I open. No, that's it's off. Yes. You do I such a great job of <laughs> yes. building that, yeah, that, frenetic like mm-hmm. every single bit in me <laughs> is about to that. lose it yeah. if I don't do this in that particular part of the story that was yeah yeah yes for the listeners what we're doing is we're re- referencing a scene in which the the male protagonist comes and finds the female protagonist who's having a, a professional meeting and whose client arrives but he's masturbating her under the table I love that. They're so, I don't know, I don't know how they do it. Um, I quite like my hand is frothy. Mm. Frothy is a good word. Frothy is a good, nasty word. Frothy is a good word. Uh, But I tell you what I really like as well. I know I'm choosing random lines and being irritating and not not obeying you, but (laughs) the moment I like is when she starts coming. And the client doesn't know what she's doing. And of course, her lover does know what she's doing. And he's trying to cover it up, but he's also wanting to laugh. And the client's just shocked and thinks that she's having a fit. And the whole restaurant's kind of erupting and thinking, oh, my God, oh, my God, the woman's having some kind of heart attack. And she's just coming. And I love reading that to people because, you know, whoever the audience is, they're they're in tears of laughter at this point. Yeah. Because it's silly apart from anything else, which is what I like. So, no, it, it's, it's on, silly so and it so on. damn sexy. And I think so often we forget that sex is supposed to be fun mm-hmm. and, you know, enjoyable. And we have moments where we yeah. laugh. And so this that was a great piece. So I, I, I think that's one of the things <laughs> that kind of made me the saddest when, when people have fed back to me about this particular story, which is, that they say to me, it's so joyful, and they're not used to that. Mm. And I think, really, I mean, how are you people fucking? What? You know why? What? Yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, there are all kinds of ways to have sex. Of course, there are all kinds yeah. of ways to have sex: loving and intense, and dark and beautiful, and, and all kinds of things. But joy, it seems to me, if laughter is too far away from the sexual space, I think yeah. you need to rethink who you're sleeping with. Listen, that's the whole word. So y'all about to learn something about me that is very personal. Go, 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 go. When I'm having sex with someone who I really care about, I laugh when I come. <laughs> Whoa. That's so good. I do. That's it's the best. So I'm having wonderful. so much fun. And the first time they're always mm-hmm. like, what? Are you mm-hmm. laughing? And mm-hmm. then they start laughing and then they get really excited that they made me so happy. Like, And are you sleeping, are you sleeping with yeah. men? I'm just not assuming any about anybody's sexuality. Okay, so you're sleeping with men. But sometimes men men have to be coaxed into laughter, to, that it's okay, that we're not laughing at them. Yes, you know? I at have. Them. I've learned, I, yeah. I find that in my experiences, men take sex as a job, whereas women take sex as a journey. You know, mm-hmm. we, women, we're, we just want to enjoy mm. every bit of it, whereas men want to perform and yeah, and, 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 yeah, and I think it isn't that yeah, yeah, because of yeah, what's they, expected and, of them, you know. No, I'm sorry, like that. Yeah, you can go, Leone. No, go but I was just saying that it makes sense for mas- a certain kind of masculinity. Yeah, yeah. That's all, and even when they it's like I have to be good at this, so I will now try to be exactly, good at it, exactly. you know? right? 
And you think, you poor thing, you don't have to be good at it. You yes. just have to be present, mm. which will And it's hard to be present when you're stuck in your head thinking about, oh, does this feel good to her? Yeah. All the time. Well, mm. Leonie, since this is our first episode yeah. and you are, mm-hmm. I lost my reading erotic fiction mm-hmm. uh, virginity to you. <laughs> We're going to be talking about first times. So do you have a first time story you'd like to share? Okay. And it can be anything. First time I tried yogurt or first time I tried a woman, whatever. You don't want me, <laughs> you don't want me to tell you about yoga. <laughs> I need to think of what I can tell you without my best friend cursing me tomorrow morning about it. First time, first time. Um, Actually, okay, no, this will be a story that's a best friend story. Um, And she will curse me because she says I have this wrong. But this is the way I remember it, whether it's wrong or not. I'm remembering the first time I met my best Mm. friend, who I have known since we were 10 years old. So that makes it 40 years this year that we've known each other. And this is my memory. This is not hers. So, you know, it's it's fair for me to say before I say it that she says I'm talking rubbish, right? (laughs) This is my memory of us knowing each other. We'd been at school with each other for a while and we'd never spoken. And then both of our parents were late to pick us up one day. And I was reading a book. I was reading a large book, but slipped inside the large book was some sex book. It wasn't porn, but it was something about human sexuality. That I remember. And at one point it became evident to her that I wasn't reading the book she thought I was reading. And so she realized I was reading this Sex book. I mean, it could have been sheer height. It could have been some kind of report on, you know, how babies were born. I have no idea, but it was something sexual, right? So then I remember us both having a giggle about this moment that she, because I was expecting her to be judgmental, but she wasn't at all. And then I remember us going into the bathroom. This is not sexual, by the way. She's totally straight. But going into the bathroom, maybe to wash our hands or whatever we were doing. And we used the loo and whatever. And then when we came out, or maybe when we didn't come out, but at some point I said to her, tell me something do you masturbate <laughs> and she said yeah and i said i'm like this cool. is a 10 year old conversation we like 10 or 11, right and yep and i thought she on some level i thought this is my tribe mm-hmm. this is someone who is so also so comfortable with sexuality that there's no condemnation there's no judgment and that was the start of our connection again i'm gonna say this my best <laughs> friend would say this is a total lie but that's how i remember it and I remember thinking that I could trust mm. her because this was the first time in my memory I'd said to another human being, do you masturbate? And they'd come back with, yes. And wow, that was that's so beautiful. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently it's a lie. I, w- I wonder what her you version never is. never tell like, with these bloody novelists. No, she just says it never <laughs> happened and I'm a liar. <laughs> I say she has a bad memory. I mean, <laughs> you are a writer, but I feel like you didn't make that up whole cloth. So <laughs> I promise, I promise, I usually know the things I make up, even if I'm trying to pass them off. I promise you. The best <laughs> I can do is say, to me, it is the truth of what happened. <laughs> yes. I like it. Put it this way at some point, she and I had a conversation about masturbation. That That's I know. That's so great. That is so great. And she didn't condemn me for it. Yay. Yeah. Well, I think we're done. This was so fun. Okay. Wow. Okay. Right? So that's how you do it. Huh? So how does it feel to you guys for, with the first time? Are you are you disappointed or are you, you know, did you have an orgasm? Is the afterglow good afterglow for you? Afterglow is or? great. I think you were a really great <laughs> first guest because you uh, get our brand of, okay. you get us. You. I feel like I found my tribe in, yeah. in you in a writer. Seriously, this is the tribe. We could meet each other in Ohio tomorrow and just go to dinner yes, and be absolutely yes. cool. We so this are was a tribe. great interview. We are sisters. Yeah, it's true. Also, I'm from Ohio, so that's the best place to meet. <laughs> <laughs> I only yeah, said Ohio because I, I think I read that one of you yeah, was from Ohio. Midwestern so girls that have a love for a good casserole and, mm-hmm. <laughs> and sex. <laughs> and sex. Mm-hmm. That, we didn't talk about food. Oh my god, we oh. talked for ages. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was fantastic. I mean, you, we really loved this story, and I've loved. I've had brown sugar, where this originally um, appeared on my 
bookshelf for years. Like it's literally moved with me maybe six times. Wow. And this has consistently been my favorite story. So for us. Wow. That is a huge compliment. Yeah, Thank I, you. It is just fantastic from beginning to end. And I love. Um, Indulge me in one last you know, moment. Why, why is it that you like it? What sure. is it about it that you so, like? So much of, because, so I am the one who I use erotica to get off. And. Yep. So much of it honestly becomes super formulaic. You know what's going to happen mm-hmm. next. You know that he's going to talk about her pert nipples. You know that yes. <laughs> she's going to talk about his member. And it's none of that. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, but that's why I don't like, you know what? I'm going to tell you a secret. I don't like oh, erotica. Girl. Yeah. Because so much of it is so We're badly written. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> We're <learning that>. We are. <laughs> <laughs> that is honestly the biggest challenge we've encountered so far is that I think Erica, you literally just said good it. Yeah, you know, she was like, we because we found how such much good erotica, erotica, erotica out there in the beginning. Yeah. And so we're like, oh, the world is just teeming with this. Yes. And and No. It's teeming with members and bosoms heaving and really bad orgasms that are not natural at all. And oh my God, it's a lot of it's really, really shit. Yes. And drag is not that. And I love that it's not bound by like the fact that, you know, she feels like a boy. I think that there are so many folks who are, have so many hangups and so many biases and all of these things that, that that's not something that, Um, would even come out in their writing but for me I just immediately connected with with the role play of it all and of her trying on all these different things and that it wasn't Mm -hmm. restricted by gender identity and you know all of the crap that we put on ourselves I just think that erotica like anything else like any other so-called good writing has to be writing of ideas Mm -hmm. it doesn't and and a lot of erotica is bad because it so easily meanders into cliche and stereotype and as you say what you expect to happen mm-hmm. next um i'm actually running a course in erotica uh, in erotic writing at the end of june because i hate so much erotica and i want to encourage people to write so it better. please so, yeah. as you have awesome. students okay. that mm-hmm. go through this course and come out of the course we are always looking right? for good work um because by black writers, by, yeah. By okay. black writers. Yeah. About black writers. I'll put it I'll put it your way. In fact, I'll go and I'll sit down and have a think. And not oh, a lot of people you. are doing it. Even less people are doing it well. And but one I'll of the things that I want to note about your helpful. story is that oh. it centers <laughs> the woman. Um, so often, so much of the writing mm-hmm. is in the guy's mind yes. about how he's pleasing a woman. And it was just our goal with this, our our ideal listener, not to say we don't want all listeners, but our ideal listener is a woman. And so we want, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I, or femme. Uh, or thank you, Anybody Karen. really uh, does not so, identify the man. Um, and we want to center <laughs> those type of people. We want to cent- We want to feel, you know, have. we want to read ourselves and see ourselves reflected in the work. And so, uh, so often we don't. And so... This was just a great story all around. Yes. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you saying so. And just for the record, in case this affected your sound, I now have a cat <laughs> sitting on my bosom, <laughs> purring. So clearly she is blessing. I don't know how that's going to mess with your recording, but she's clearly blessing your first um, Blessed your by first the pussy. Journey, <laughs> and it always comes back to bosom. <laughs> so hey. <laughs> Always comes back to pussy. Yeah. <laughs> if you send to the pussy, yes. nothing will ever go wrong. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I feel like we need to put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> Please do. Please do and give me my 10%. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Got it. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us. I. You're really yeah. welcome. Can, I, I wish you all the luck in the world with it. You obviously sound like two gorgeous, special, Thank thoughtful, you. sexy women. And oh, I love that. Yeah, and we love you. Can you, where can people <laughs> find you and your work? Um, they can, I suppose the easiest thing for American readers would be to look for Come Let Us Sing Anyway on Amazon. You can find it on amazon.com and amazon.co.uk or you can Google my publishers. I think this is important because they're a small indie and they need the support. 
And actually, I make more money if you buy it from them than Amazon. Fuck Amazon. <laughs> um, so their name is People Tree. P E E P A L. People Tree. People Tree Press. And awesome. they are the biggest Caribbean and Black British um, publisher. So they need some bigging up. So I would go, I would just Google People Tree Press. Fantastic. And you're on Instagram at Leone.Ross and yep. Twitter is at yep, Leone Rice um, Ross all together. Yep. Yep. That's awesome. Me. Y'all go follow her. We're going to drop details to <laughs> her writing in the show notes for this episode so that to make it that much easier. So I think the other thing as well, obviously we needn't put this on the, on, on the recording if you don't want to, but I think this is important for people just if they want help. I run an occasional blog called Dear Writer Girl on my website, which is leoniross.com, just that can be of help to people. And it includes someone asking me about how to write erotica really well. And there's quite a long answer on it. So if people are interested in that, they're welcome to go find Perfect. it. Perfect. Thank you so thank much you. for sharing thank that. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much for your time. I'm so glad you asked me to do it. This is lovely. <laughs> This episode was produced by us, Erica and Kenria, and edited by Ballistic. The theme song is from Brazy. Every five-star review that you post on Apple Podcasts between now and July 31st, 2019 will be entered into a raffle to win a copy of one of the books that we read on the show. We need your help, and we're giving away five books. You just need to post your review and then email a screenshot of it to the turnonpodcast at gmail.com to enter. And please take a minute to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app. Follow us on Twitter at The Turn On Pod and Instagram at The Turn On Podcast. And find links to books, transcripts, guest info, and other dope shit at TheTurnOnPodcast.com. Peace.